Hello students, I am Dr. Nagashree from Department of Physiology at PSG Institute of Medical Sciences and Research, Coimbatore. Now you have chosen to study about the basic physiology of blood coagulation. So, coagulation in medicine is the clotting of blood. The process by which the blood clots to form solid mass is called as a coagulation. And all the mechanisms involved in the clotting together is known as hemostasis. So, the term hemostasis refers to spontaneous arrest or prevention of bleeding by physiological process. So, coagulation is highly conserved throughout biology. In all the mammals, coagulation involves two things. One is a cellular component which is mainly by the platelets and a protein component which is by the coagulation factors. So, coagulation begins almost instantaneously after an injury to the blood vessel wall which produces damage to the endothelium which is lining the vessel wall. So, this module aims to make you know the mechanisms that help in blood clotting. It will make you know to learn about the anticoagulant mechanisms in our body both in vivo and in vitro anticoagulants and disorders related to blood clotting. It will help you to understand the methods of blood coagulation tests. Now, we will see about the mechanism of hemostasis. So, whenever the blood vessel wall is severed, hemostasis is achieved by the following mechanisms. So, the first mechanism is the vasoconstriction of the vessel wall. Next is formation of platelet plug, formation of blood clot fibrous organization of the blood clot that is formed and the final thing is the clot retraction that occurs. So, one by one we will see the steps involved in the hemostasis. So, the first is the vasoconstriction of the vessel wall. So, any injury to the vessel wall causes the smooth muscles present in the wall of the vessels to contract. So, this will immediately reduce the blood flow to the site of injury. So, this occurs due to the following mechanisms. So, the first mechanism is the local myogenic spasm. That means, whenever there is injury to the vessel wall, the smooth muscles present in the vessel wall will contract immediately. So, this is called as a local myogenic spasm. The second is release of autocoid factors from the traumatized tissues and the blood platelets. Mainly, the platelets release a substance called as thromboxane A2, which is a potent vasoconstrictor. That means, it will cause constriction of the blood vessel wall, which in turn again will prevent the bleeding from occurring. So, the third mechanism that produces vasoconstriction is the nervous reflexes. So, whenever there is injury to the vessel wall, these nerves are damaged which will cause pain in that area. So, this pain in turn will produce a certain reflex mechanisms which will produce again vasoconstriction of the vessel wall. So, now before going into the next mechanism that is mechanism of platelet plug formation, I will just tell you what the platelets are. So, platelets are otherwise called as thrombocytes. So, they are minute disc like cells which are present in the blood and they are 1 to 4 micrometers in diameter. The normal blood concentration of platelets varies between 1.5 to 3 lakhs per microliter. So, this will decrease in case of certain infections now commonly like in dengue fever and all. So, this platelets, they have certain contractile proteins present within their cytoplasm. So, these contractile proteins are called as actin, myosin and thrombostenin. Now, we will go into the mechanism of platelet plug formation. So, these platelets, as I told you, when they come in contact with the damaged endothelial wall when the vessel is injured, they will change their characteristics or in other words when they are exposed to the collagen which is exposed in turn exposed, 
when there is a damage to the vessel wall these platelets will change their characteristics so how do they change their characteristics they will swell they will assume irregular forms how do they assume the irregular forms they will cause pseudopores to protrude from their surfaces now the contractile proteins which is present within the platelets which i already told you they will contract and they will release various active factors so now when these active factors are released they platelets become sticky and they attach to the collagen which is exposed in the vessel wall and they also attach to another factor called as von willebrand factor which is present on the endothelium now the adp and the thromboxane which is present in the platelets and the nearby area they will act on the other platelets which is present in the blood and it causes them to adhere to the previously adherent platelets now more and more platelets they will come and adhere there and they form a blood or a platelet plug which prevents the blood loss so now the second step that is involved in the hemostasis is formation of blood clot now we first saw the platelets will form a plug so next that is not sufficient for the bleeding to stop so you need to form have a solid clot there for the bleeding to stop so thus we need to know about the formation of blood clot how it forms now the activated substances from the vessel wall at the site of injury or from the platelets or from the blood proteins which is adhering to the vessel wall they will initiate the clotting process so within 3 to 6 minutes after the rupture of the vessel wall the vessel now will get filled with a solid clot after 30 minutes to 1 hour the clot will retract and it will close the vessel wall so that is the overall mechanism of clotting so now we will see one by one so now what is the basic theory for this coagulation why at all normally the blood doesn't clot within the vessel wall normally the blood doesn't clot within the vessel wall so only when there is injury to the vessel wall it clots so what is the mechanism behind that so there are some substances in the blood which promotes the coagulation which is called as procoagulants and there are other substances in the blood which will inhibit the coagulation called anticoagulants so now i have introduced two new terminologies procoagulants and the anticoagulants normally the balance between these two factors the procoagulants and the anticoagulants maintains the blood in the liquid state and thus it helps in the circulation of the blood so in the blood normally the anticoagulants are predominant that's why the blood will not clot so if there is any injury at the site of injury the procoagulants gets activated and the clot forms now what are the clotting factors which is present in the blood so there are 13 clotting factors present in the blood so we don't have factor number 6 so all the other remaining factors are labeled from factor 1 to 13 i'll now just name what the factors are so factor 1 is fibrinogen factor 2 is called as prothrombin factor 3 is called as a tissue factor factor 4 is called as calcium factor 5 is called as proaxillarin or labein factor there is no factor 6 factor 7 is called as serum prothrombin conversion accelerator or the other name for it is stable factor factor 8 is called as antihemophilic factor or antihemophilic factor a factor 9 is called as plasma thromboplastin component or christmas factor or it's otherwise called as antihemophilic factor b factor 10 is called as stuart power factor or stuart factor factor 11 is plasma thromboplastin component factor 12 is hegemans factor factor 13 is fibrin stabilizing factor 
So all these clotting factors, they are present in the inactive form in the blood normally. So now we will see about the extrinsic pathway for initiating the clotting. So this pathway begins when blood comes in contact with the traumatized vessel wall or any extravascular tissues. So traumatized tissue, it will release what is called as tissue factor or tissue thromboplastin which is mainly composed of phospholipids. Now this tissue factor which is released, it will complex with blood coagulation factors 7 and in the presence of the calcium ions, it will act on factor 10 in order to form the activated factor 10 which is called as the 10A. So now the factor 10 is activated. Now this activated factor 10, it combines with the phospholipids and factor 5 in order to form prothrombin activator. But this factor 5 is in the inactive form. So this has to be activated. So this is done by the thrombin. So the prothrombin activator in the presence of calcium ions, it will split the prothrombin in order to form thrombin. So that is how the prothrombin activator is formed in the extrinsic pathway of coagulation. Now this mechanism can occur through intrinsic pathway of coagulation also. So now what is this intrinsic pathway of coagulation? So this will begin whenever there is trauma to the blood or exposure of the blood to collagen from a traumatized tissue. Now the blood trauma, it causes activation of the factor 12 and it will also release of platelet factor 3. So now activated factor 12 in turn activates factor 11 in the presence of kininogen and is accelerated by precalicrain. Now this activated factor 11, this in turn acts enzymatically on factor 9 to activate this factor 9. Once the factor 9 is activated along with the activated factor 8, platelet phospholipids and platelet factor 3 and calcium ions, all these together they will activate factor 10. Now this activated factor 10 combines with factor 5 and platelet phospholipids in the presence of calcium ions in order to form prothrombin activator. So this final step where the factor 10 is activated is common for both the intrinsic pathway and the extrinsic pathway. So next is the common pathway where finally the prothrombin activator is formed and this prothrombin activator in the presence of calcium causes conversion of prothrombin into thrombin. Now this thrombin is activated. So this thrombin in turn it will cause polymerization of fibrinogen molecules into fibrin fibers within 10 to 15 seconds. Now this fibrin fibers which are formed are monomers. So now this has to be polymerized. So these fibrin monomer molecules they polymerize within seconds into long fibrin fibers that constitutes the reticulum of the blood clot. Now this polymerized fibrin fibers in turn it will get solidified in order to form the blood clot. So thrombin activates another factor called as fibrin stabilizing factor that causes the covalent bonds between the fibrin monomer molecules which increases the three dimensional strength of the fibrin meshwork. Thus a strong blood clot is formed. Now what is this blood clot composed of? So this blood clot is composed of meshwork of fibrin fibers, the blood cells, platelets and the plasma. So the fibrin fibers also adheres to the damaged surface and blood clot becomes adherent to the vascular opening and prevents the blood loss. Once critical amount of thrombin is formed, a positive feedback develops and causes still more blood 
clotting. Thus, this is an example of positive feedback mechanisms in physiology. So, thus the blood clot continues to grow more and more and it will seal the area of damage and it will prevent the leakage of the blood from that particular area. So, now we have seen about the formation of clot. Now, next what happens is after a few minutes this clot will retract which is called as clot retraction. So, how does this clot retraction occurs? So, the, when the clot retracts it will express what is called as serum. So, the serum cannot clot because it lacks the clotting factors. The platelet thrombocytin, actin, myosin which are all the contractile proteins in the platelets they cause contraction of the platelet spicules attached to the fibrin. So, this compresses the fibrin meshwork into a smaller mass. So, this is called as the clot retraction. So, as the clot retracts the edges of the broken vessel they are pulled together. So, now again this is another mechanism which makes sure that blood will not leak through the area of the vascular endothelium. Now, a total sealing is formed. Next what happens is this clot cannot stay there for a longer time. So, it has to lyse. So, the mechanism is called as lysis of blood clot. So, how does this occur? When the clot is formed large amounts of plasminogen is entrapped in the clot in the inactive form. So, plasminogen is another substance which is present in the blood and this is in the inactive form. So, few days later after the clot has stopped the bleeding tissue plasminogen activator is substance that is released by injured tissues and the vascular endothelium. So, this converts the inactive plasminogen into active plasmin. Now, this plasminogen is activated and it is converted into plasmin. So, what is the function of this plasmin? So, this plasmin will digest the fibrin fibers, the fibrinogen, prothrombin, factors 5, 7 and 12. Thus, the clot lyses. So, that is about the mechanism of hemostasis. So, now we will go into the applied aspects of these hemostasis in the medical field. So, you must know what are the anticoagulants that is present both within the blood and outside the blood. So, first we will see about the in vivo anticoagulants. So, the most important in vivo anticoagulant is called as heparin. So, heparin is a polysaccharide containing sulphate group with a molecular weight of 15,000 to 18,000. This facilitates the action of antithrombin 3 and thus inhibits the active forms of factors 9, 10, 11 and 12. And this heparin it cannot be present there the action of the heparin cannot be there in the blood always. So, it is digested by an enzyme called as heparinase. The second anticoagulant in the blood is antithrombin 3. So, this acts by inhibiting the thrombin formation. Protein C is another anticoagulant in the blood. So, how does it act? This acts by inactivating factors 5 and 8 and an inhibitor of tissue plasminogen activator. Thus, it increases the formation of plasmin which lyses the clot. Now, we will see about few synthetic anticoagulants. So, first is vitamin K antagonists. They are active orally. So, example for it is dicomerol and warfarin. Vitamin K deficiency thus produced it will lead to deficiency of prothrombin factors 8, 9, 10, protein S and protein C. So, these are the in vivo anticoagulants. 
Now we will see about the in vitro anticoagulants. So blood that is collected in the siliconized containers does not clot for 1 hour because silicon prevents the contact activation of platelets and factor 12. Various substances that will decrease the calcium ion concentration in the blood prevents the coagulation. Example for it is sodium citrate, sodium oxalate, EDTA that is ethylene, diamine, tetraacetic acid all these forms insoluble salts with calcium and thus it will prevent the action of the calcium. So heparin can also be used as in vitro anticoagulant. So details of which we have already dealt with. So that is about the anticoagulants. Now we will see few conditions that will produce excessive bleeding in the body. The first one is vitamin K deficiency. So when does this vitamin K deficiency occur? So this will occur in diseases of liver like hepatitis, cirrhosis. So all these will cause malfunction of the liver which in turn will cause decrease in the production of the clotting factors and depress the clotting system. So deficiency of vitamin K decreases the production of factors 7, 9, 10, prothrombin and protein C. The next condition that produces excessive bleeding is hemophilia A. So it is a bleeding disorder that will usually occurs in males. Here females are the carriers and the disorder is predominantly present in the males. So it is a genetic disorder and it occurs due to deficiency of factor 8 and it is called as hemophilia A. So if one of the X chromosomes in women is deficient, she will become a hemophilic carrier and they will be transmitting the disease to half of her male children and transmitting the carrier state to half of her female children. So in these children, the bleeding usually occurs after any trauma. So when there is bleeding, the patient is treated by injecting factor 8. So the next condition that produces excessive bleeding is thrombocytopenia. So presence of less number of platelets is called as thrombocytopenia. So why this is important? Because whenever the platelet count falls below 50,000 cells per microliter, then bleeding tendency occurs. So you can see many small purplish patches over the skin and they are called as thrombocytopenic purpura or purpuric spots. So bleeding here is treated by giving fresh blood transfusions or you can give concentrates of platelets or you can give, you can do splenectomy which is removal of spleen. So we have seen about the disorders that will produce excessive bleeding. Now we will see the disorders which will produce thrombus or embolus which is called as thromboembolic conditions. Now what is a thrombi and what is an emboli? An abnormal clot that develops in the vessel is called as a thrombus and when the blood flows past this clot, it can break this clot from the attachment and can cause the clot to flow with the blood called as the emboli. So it can be due to roughened endothelial surface or any atherosclerotic plaque, infections or trauma. Tissue plasminogen activator is used to treat these thromboembolic conditions. Another condition which is related to this is disseminated intravascular coagulation. So here when large amount of traumatized tissue or dying tissue is present in the body, it will release large quantities of tissue factor. Clotic mechanisms get activated in widespread areas of circulation giving rise to the above condition. So plugging of the peripheral vessels in this condition leads to decrease the delivery of oxygen and nutrients to the tissues which will exacerbate the circulatory shock which is already present in the patient. 
so it's a very dangerous condition which has to be attended immediately so these are the few applied aspects relating to the coagulation now we will see what are the tests for hemostasis so we are having two important parameters one is the bleeding time and the other is the clotting time so first we will see about the bleeding time so it is a time interval between the skin puncture and spontaneous unassisted stoppage of bleeding so this can done be done by two methods one is the duke's method so here the procedure for this duke's method is you have to first clean the tip of the left ring finger and allow it to dry then make a bold prick and start the stopwatch now mop the first drop of the blood on one end of the piece of filter paper now after some 15 seconds you have to mop the second drop of the blood in the same way a little further along the strip of the filter paper mop similarly every 15 seconds till the bleeding stops once the bleeding stops you stop the stopwatch now note the bleeding time by noting the time on the stopwatch or by counting the number of spots of blood on the filter paper and multiplying it by 15 seconds the normal bleeding time is between 2 to 4 minutes and it is prolonged in thrombocytopenic purpura the bleeding time can also be done by another method called as the ivs method so here you apply a blood pressure cuff over the left upper arm and raise the pressure to 40 mm of mercury now you clean a small area on the anterior surface of the left forearm and allow it to dry after it has dried puncture the clean dried area of the forearm about 2 mm deep and now you start the stopwatch mop the drops of blood with a strip of filter paper every 10 seconds as previously done till the bleeding stops now stop the watch stopwatch and note the bleeding time on the stopwatch or count the number of drops of blood on the filter paper and multiply it by 10 so that's about the bleeding time so now we will see about the clotting time so it is the time interval between the entry of blood into the capillary tube and formation of the fibrin threads now this clotting time can also be done by two methods so one is the capillary tube method so how do you do this capillary tube method so obtain a drop of blood by finger puncture start the stopwatch draw the blood immediately into a glass capillary tube by placing one end of the capillary tube on the drop of the blood keep the tube between the palms of both the hand to keep it at body temperature for 1 to 2 minutes so after 2 minutes you start snapping off small lengths of the tube every 15 seconds till a thin thread of fibrin has formed between the broken ends of the tube now you stop the stopwatch and note the time the normal clotting time is 3 to 8 minutes so this clotting time is prolonged in case of deficiency of clotting factor 8 which is called as the hemophilia now this clotting time can also be done by two methods so one is the capillary tube method so how do you do this capillary tube method so obtain a drop of blood by finger puncture start the stopwatch draw the blood immediately into a glass capillary tube by placing one end of the capillary tube on the drop of the blood keep the tube between the palms of both the hand to keep it at body temperature for 1 to 2 minutes so after 2 minutes you start snapping off small lengths of the tube every 15 seconds till a thin thread of fibrin has formed between the broken ends of the tube now you stop the stopwatch and note the time the normal clotting time is 3 to 8 minutes so this clotting time is 
prolonged in case of deficiency of clotting factor 8 which is called as the hemophilia. Clotting time can also be done by another method called as a Lee and White method. So here you take the test tubes, mark 1 ml on the test tube, 2 clean glass test tubes, draw 5 ml of blood by vein puncture, start the stopwatch as soon as the blood starts entering the syringe. Fill the test tubes with the blood up till 1 mark. Now plug the test tubes with the cotton wool, place the test tubes in the water bath at 37 degree centigrade. Now remove one test tube from the water bath after 3 minutes. Tilt the test tube to an angle of 45 degrees and see whether the blood has clotted or not. If the blood has not clotted, return the tube to the water bath and examine for clotting every 30 seconds. As soon as the blood has clotted in the tube, now you examine the second tube immediately as to whether the blood has clotted in it or not. So the blood in the second tube clots usually and note the time now. This gives the clotting time. So this is how you do the test for hemostasis, the bleeding time and the clotting time. To conclude, but coagulation has got innumerable applications in the medical field. The in vivo anticoagulants which we already saw are used to treat various cardiovascular disorders and thromboembolic disorders. The in vitro anticoagulants are used to store blood in the blood banks and for also doing the practicals in the lab. So test for hemostasis is used to diagnose various bleeding disorders and clotting factors and platelets which we discussed are used to treat these disorders.